we have an opportunity here in Massachusetts to change that. So without further ado, I want to introduce our next United States Senator, Jay The Real Deal. This is awesome. Thank you, Caroline. By the way, let's give a big round of applause to Caroline for she's yes. quite the energy today. Doing an incredible job. And Joey and Billy, thank you guys for doing an incredible job doing the music. You know, you guys did uh, a, an event. What was it? Melrose. Uh, Stoneham. 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 They did an event in Stoneham and I forgot to recognize them then. They've been helping with the campaign. I know, right? What am I thinking? What am I thinking? Ungrateful. But uh, deplorable. That's what I am. Deplorable. I think we've got a room full of deplorables, don't we? God bless deplorables. God bless Donald Trump. By the way, is anybody here from the George Soros Tracking Company? Anybody here? Any trackers right here? I'm looking for the tracker. It's like finding Waldo. You know, you're trying to see who the tracker is, make sure I look good on camera. The, I don't know if you guys heard about this. George Soros is the guy that uh, tries to shake things up here in the United States. He funded all the marijuana laws, all that stuff. He's paying a company in the United States to track Republican candidates. And a few months ago, when I first started going out to events and speaking, he had these trackers coming into events. And literally, this, this giant camera, somebody would sit like right in the front row with one of those like NFL cameras, you know, when somebody's got that giant lens, that huge lens. And they'd sit there, the thing would be like right in your face, and they're recording everything you're saying because they want to use it against you for the future. Look, that's not what America's all about. I, you know, when I first ran for office, of course, I didn't have any trackers. I was running for state representative. Uh, I am from the town of Whitman. Anybody know the South Shore area whatsoever? We got an Abington resident over there, so Abington's in the house. If you don't know Whitman, it's the home of the Toll House cookie. The, the citizens say you're welcome. I know nobody makes the cookies, right? They just have that tube of uh, dough in the refrigerator. But anyway, I'm from the South Shore, and I came in in the same year as uh, Shauna O'Connell from Taunton in 2010. Shauna O'Connell, anybody know Shauna? Anybody know a guy named Jim Lyons from uh, Andover? Anybody know, uh, uh, let's see, who holds it? We got Mark Lombardo up in the Bill Rick area. Anybody know Mark? We got some great, great folks in the house. Look, I really appreciate you guys coming out today and uh, again Joey Billy thanks for providing the entertainment Caroline thanks for getting everybody uh, out here look there's gonna be a lot more events we're 16 months away from this election cycle but you can't start too soon and like I said I've been at this for about four months already trying to organize decide if we're gonna make a run and I don't know if you guys have heard this but on August 1st uh, in the town of Whitman at the VFW at 7 p.m. I am gonna make the announcement that we are gonna move forward and run in a You can only spend so much time making up your mind, and I'll tell you, going around the state, talking to everybody, uh, I've been out from Wellfleet to uh, Belchertown, from Lowell and Lawrence down to New Bedford. I mean, we've been all over the state uh, with events everywhere. We're talking to everybody, and clearly nobody is happy with Elizabeth Warren. I mean, are you guys happy with Elizabeth Warren? No. Even on, even on Beacon Hill. Democrats will whisper to me in the state house, you gotta beat Elizabeth Warren, we can't stand her. She's pushing her party so far to the left. People, they really don't like uh, what she's doing down in Washington, D.C. And by the way, I don't know why they say they don't like what she's doing, because quite honestly, she's done nothing for us down in Washington, D.C. Nothing. She's had one bill passed the entire time she's been down there. It was related to transparency on voting. It had nothing to do to help Massachusetts. The guy she replaced, Scott Brown, in just two years had three bills that he personally filed and passed, okay? One of them was to keep Stafford loan interest rates for college students at a lower rate. That's Scott Brown, but she complains about the cost of tuition and as we know, also makes that, what, $350,000 to teach one course at Harvard? She's written two books, two books in office, made $1.6 million on those two books. You know, went on a, on a tour around the country talking about this, down in New York City on talk shows, saying that we're part of, you guys are all part of a stew of racists if you ugly voted for Donald stew. Trump. Right. An ugly stew, Patty, yes, exactly. That's, I, thanks for modifying that. Uh, look, 
I have a, a track record on Beacon Hill that I think matches up with, with Elizabeth Warren. So I wanted to come talk to you guys a little bit about why I think I'm the candidate to make this run. So just, you know, if you want to hear a little bit about me, if you don't know me, uh, I'll tell you this. I was 40 years old when I decided to run for office. You know, I had two daughters that were six and two, and I was on the town finance committee. My wife and I own a small business in the town of Hanson right next to Whitman. Uh, it's a performing arts school. My wife teaches dance and acting and modeling and voice and all that stuff. And I work for a sign company out of New Bedford. And a uh, big, big sign company, actually. We uh, did a lot of work. Actually, it's buildings like this. It's uh, signage that goes on buildings like this. That's what I was working on. A lot of big banks. The last project I worked on was the Sitco sign. We changed out all the uh, neon tubing to LEDs. Right, so uh, I was working for you know a company that was working with small businesses to try to you know get a start in their in their business or uh, or businesses that wanted to modify you know kind of get upgraded and do a better job and that's really where I started to meet families that own these businesses you know uh, mom and pop shops that just were trying to you know provide a better living for themselves for their kids for the future and so you know um, I'm also an Eagle Scout. I was, anybody involved in scouting when you were a kid? Anybody here? Yeah, raise your hand. Hi. If you're an Eagle Scout, you know, uh, you raise your left hand because you got to use your left hand for stuff. But uh, my folks got divorced when I was uh, seven, and um, mom was married three times, my dad was married three times. So in my early days, I ended up uh, moving around a lot, going to a lot of different schools. I didn't have a lot of stability growing up, and uh, I was very lucky to get involved in Cub Scouts, then into Boy Scouts, because the Scoutmasters kind of became a surrogate family for me. and. Um, you know, my fellow scoutmates were important. And what you learn in scouting is not only how to build a, a campfire, right? Not only uh, do the do a good turn daily, but also to leave the campground better than you found it. That's kind of one of the big things that I took with me from scouting was that you always want to try to leave something better off than you found it, you know? And uh, so I met my wife in New York City. She's from the town of Whitman, so we ended up uh, getting, we got engaged uh, four months after we met on a blind date. And uh, blind dates do work, okay. And uh, and I got very lucky. And um, we got married a year later, and we uh, we moved to my wife's hometown of Whitman. So uh, I got very lucky with a uh, great town that I live in. And I also uh, have two daughters, uh, 15 and 11. And I always thought that I was going to have a boy, and I would join a scout troop, and that that'd be my chance to kind of give back in some way for the people who've helped me in my life, whether it was scouting or college or in my career, kind of helping me, you know, pick me up and move me along. And, uh, and two daughters that hate camping and uh, love ballet later, there was really no, uh, no scout troop I was going to be joining. So, uh, so again, I was 40 years old. I decided to join the finance committee in my town. I'm serving in the town board. And we have a state rep that keeps voting with the Speaker of the House. Uh, who, by the way, was Sal DeMacy, all right, voting with the Speaker, voting for the Speaker, and then voting with the Speaker to raise our sales tax six and a quarter, double tax on alcohol. He was the Vice Chair of Education. When I debated him, we talked about the fact that there was zero hearings in Massachusetts to switch over to Common Core. Anybody a Common Core fan in this room? Oh. I didn't think so. Okay. So, uh, so anyway, I... I, I I was on the finance committee, I said, is anybody going to run against this guy? And it was 2008, and nobody was. So I said, well, can I run against the guy? And they said, well, you got to join your local Republican town committee. So I did. I joined the local town committee, and I asked them, is anybody going to run from the town committee against this guy? It was going to be 2010. And they said, no, go ahead. So I read two books on how to run for office, and I uh, put together a team, literally two books, and um, put together a team. We mapped out uh, from election day backwards what we had to do to win. And we ran the race, and I knocked on a, a gazillion doors in that time frame and uh, in three towns, and we ended up winning. Now, just so you know, I wasn't favored to win that race at all. The, the seat had been held by Democrats for 14 years. John Walsh, the Democratic Party chair, anybody know John Walsh or of John Walsh? He brought us to Bob Patrick, so thanks, John Walsh, first of all. Now he's running Seti Warren's campaign, just to give you a little bit of perspective. So John Walsh lived in Abington, one of my towns. Shannon O'Brien, who ran against Mitt Romney for governor, she lives in my town of Whitman. And in fact, our kids were on the same soccer team. My daughter and her daughter were on the same soccer team. She stopped talking to me after I filed a run as a Republican for state rep. So there you go. And uh, my opponent was from the town of East Bridgewater, the third town. His father had been state rep and state senator before him. His father was registered probate. So I didn't know what I didn't know, and that is that in politics in Massachusetts, it's like a blood sport. And as soon as I registered to run for office, man, my life changed overnight. It was crazy. But 
I believed in uh, myself, I believed in the message, which was, you know, trying to be more accountable on Beacon Hill with our tax dollars. It certainly wasn't happening, and I was pretty disappointed with it. And so uh, I ran, I ended up winning, and like I said, we had a great class of 2010. We doubled our number from 16 to 32 of Republicans in the House. Scott Brown won in that 2010 cycle. Everybody remember Scott Brown? <laughs> right? You know, and that was pretty exciting, because Scott Brown called a lot of us candidates who were running for state rep and said, drop what you're doing, help my race, and if you do, and if I win, I'm going to be able to provide some support and endorsements and all that when you guys run in, you know, later on in November. So he ended up winning, and I think he was a big part of how we were able to add more numbers up on Beacon Hill. So it was a great year. 2010 was exciting. 2011 is when I was sworn in, and I filed the, one of the first bills I filed was to help with the foreclosure crisis. I'm sure everybody remembers 2008, 2009, the, the foreclosure problems we had, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the bad loans, the subprime lending that was going on because the government was... You guys remember uh, Barney Frank, the banking committee, right? Barney Frank. Yeah, exactly. Forcing, forcing companies to provide subprime loans and uh, basically undercutting that market. I mean, that's, that was a huge story that continues to not be... When you watch that movie, Big Short, they never leave... They never include the part about where government was trying to get all those subprime loans uh, going. Anyway, uh, people in my district are having problems. I don't have any major industry, no major retail. I have no federal buildings, no state buildings, so I don't have to go to Beacon Hill on my knees you know, begging for stuff and su selling out to people in my district. I get to go and vote for the average folks who get up to work every day. Either they own a small business, they work for a small business. I'm the luckiest guy uh, on Beacon Hill because I get to work for the people. So there was, a, there was a bill that I filed that got adopted in the first budget to, uh, for the state to try to help out with people with uh, foreclosure crisis uh, issues. And I ended up being selected as an emerging leader in 2011 by a group called the State Legislative Leadership Foundation. Say that 10 times fast. And I got to go down to the University of Virginia, a Darden School of Business with 49 other legislators from around the country to learn about state and uh, federal issues. So I got a really quick start, but uh, it was 2013, that was the big year where I got to really kind of put, uh, put the muscle uh, you know, to the test there, which was Deval Patrick had just pa uh, proposed a $2 billion tax increase. I don't know, anybody remember this $2 billion? He wanted to tax sodas and candy, and he wanted to, he, he added a dollar to the cigarette tax. He, um, there was the technology tax, six and a quarter, they were gonna apply to technology services. That was the tech tax that got repealed six weeks later, right? Hey Al, how you doing? Al Ferris, everybody. You made it, nice to see you. Better late than never. Thanks for coming out. Uh, and by the way, I just want to say, if I don't have, didn't have a chance to say hello before, I think I got to about this part of the room, I am going to make my way around the rest of the room back here. So, and anybody else who shows up uh, between now and then, Al, I'll be sure to talk to you before I go. Okay. Anyway. Um, How are you? So the technology tax was repealed, but this gas tax, this index gas tax, that stuck. And we, people didn't even know because it was July of 2013. So imagine right now in July, this thing passing, nobody even knew their tax went up. The gas tax went up, let alone the fact that it was indexed to go on up every year automatically without a vote. So we had to educate folks. We wanted to repeal this thing. I got together with a group of folks that said, let's do a ballot question. They, they shot it down in the House chamber, shot it down in the Senate, trying to repeal this index gas tax. So we decided to take it out as a ballot question. We organized and we recruited people to volunteer. I know there's a lot of volunteers uh, here in the House uh, today who are helping out in the Senate campaign were there for the gas tax ballot question. So thank you for then, thank you now. That's the kind of grassroots work that we're gonna to need to win this race. But we ended up, you know, we were facing $3 million that was spent against us on that ballot question. They told us it would be $3 million. It was $3 million. AAA used their uh, logo in the branded advertising on TV. Uh, we were up against it, you know, and Beacon Hill did not want this to pass. There was collusion going on with the Department of Transportation and Chambers of Commerce trying to keep this in place. But uh, we knew that, you know, first of all, there's no other tax that goes up automatically in Massachusetts without a vote. The other thing, too, is that 50% uh, of the gas tax gets siphoned off to the MBTA. So if you live in central or western Mass, what good is 50% of your gas tax helping you? It's not helping you at all. And then we also proved that Massachusetts spends four times the national average on our road maintenance. So one mile of road right out there, 600, $675,000 a year 
away from maintaining one section of road in Massachusetts. That's the average cost for us, okay? The national average is four times less, including New Hampshire, which has pretty darn good roads uh, for, exactly, for a lot less money. So we, we proved in that ballot question that money wasn't being spent correctly. We proved that there was no representative vote. It was just going to be an automatic blank check to DOT the next year. So we proved all that stuff. We ended up uh, outperforming Charlie Baker in that he beat Martha Copley by 40,000 votes. We beat Charlie Baker with a ballot question by 50,000 votes. So that was awesome. That was, that was awesome. definitely an exciting time and, and it kind of you know showed us we had just had Scott Brown win in 2010 we had the ballot question in 2014 and then Ch uh, Charlie Baker also won uh, at that time so you started to say hey maybe the tide is turning for uh, conservatives or for Republicans in the state but then uh, Boston 2024 popped its ugly head up and you guys probably remember the Olympics the idea of having the Olympics come to Massachusetts right you guys remember the proposals of VIP lanes coming in and out of Boston for the athletes right because we don't have a problem getting into Boston right now so let's just take a whole other lane out of, out of uh, use right yeah, so that's what they were proposing. They wanted to take uh, trees down on the common, build a temporary stadium, probably for badminton or something, and then tear it down and then put the trees back up. I mean, that's the kind of boondoggle that they were talking about. The average overruns for the Olympics, the last five Olympics, has been $10 billion. $10 billion. The Montreal Olympics from, 2000, uh, from sorry, 1976 just got paid off a few years ago. That's how disastrous the Olympics can be for your city, for your state. And London went from $5 billion to $15 billion. So we just know that it's a huge boondoggle. But hey, Deval Patrick was uh, promoting it, and Deval Patrick was only charging uh, a small $7,500 a day to promote that whole boondoggle. They, they thought the fix was in, and they thought we were stupid. They thought that uh, we wouldn't notice that there was actually two bids floating around out there. There was bid version one, where Massachusetts taxpayers were told that uh, we wouldn't have to pay for any overruns. The Olympics would be totally profitable, no tax dollars needed. But then there was a version of the bid that was discovered that was given to the International Olympic Committee that said, oh, no, 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 Massachusetts taxpayers have no problem funding the overruns. Don't worry, they'll pick up the tab when it's time, when this little circus leaves town. That was the kind of baloney that was going on. So I filed a language in the House to block taxpayer funding for overruns. That got shot down. Uh, Bob Hedlund from, this, uh, from Weymouth actually was a senator at the time, he's now mayor. He filed the Senate version, that got shot down. So I ended up working with Evan Falchuk, who had run for governor as an independent, uh, United Independent Party. We partnered up, filed the language to, uh, drafted and filed the language for another ballot question, did a press conference on the steps of the State House with his independent team and the gas tax folks that had helped out. We did a huge press conference, and a week later, the uh, Boston 2024 folks said, forget it, this scam is over, let's leave town. And they did. They ended up leaving Massachusetts. We saved ourselves a ton of money. I forgot to mention that, that the Globe, that the Globe actually blamed us with a gas tax ballot question for costing $2 billion in lost transportation revenue. Well, I say that's $2 billion that you, the taxpayers, got to keep. And we've been able to avoid three different tax increases because we've stopped it from going up every year automatically. Hey, we're the state of no taxation without representation, for gosh sakes. So, uh, so anyway, uh, here we are. We, we've had these great victories. I talked to my wife. I have, by the way, I haven't been opposed in my last two election cycles, uh, you know, I was opposed, I ran against incumbent, then I was opposed, and the last two times I haven't been opposed because the people in my district, even with those Democrats there, they understand that the work I've been doing on Beacon Hill is not for Republicans, it's not for Democrats, it's not for independents, it's for everybody. What I'm trying to do up on Beacon Hill, the votes I take, the bills I support, uh, the work we do outside the chamber, has always been about trying to make sure that you are represented. And my best ideas on Beacon Hill always come from talking to folks like you. So, you know, that's what it's all about. And uh, I thought, all right, <clears throat> 2016, I don't have an opponent. Time to take a break. Enjoy time with the kids. And then I went to Ernie Buck Jr.'s house, and he had this backyard barbecue, and he had Donald Trump show up. Yeah. Uh, I saw Donald Trump speak and I said, oh my gosh, this guy is unbelievable. He's saying everything that we all believe in, but everything that we elected officials are afraid to say. I mean, I'll, I'll admit it. The stuff he was saying was like, 
I, I can't talk like Donald Trump talks. I'd be, I'd be out of office like tomorrow if I said it was, you know. But, but he was absolutely right about putting America first, about saying that immigrants, we don't, we don't have a problem with immigration, we have a problem with illegal immigration because it's costing our state. It's costing the state of Massachusetts at minimum $1.8 billion a year for illegal immigrants that, that cover their costs. He, he wasn't even talking at the time about sanctuary city or sanctuary state status, but now that's been added into the mix. And you guys know it's not just a financial drain, but it's a literal public safety risk when you have people with criminal backgrounds that aren't being deported and ICE officials can't do their job. We end up having situations like those two doctors, the double murder of those doctors of a guy who had robbed a bank twice, should have been deported, but the liberal judge gave him 364 days instead of 365 days because 365 would have triggered a deportation. So that's what's going on in our state. It's crazy. So Donald, well, there you go. So anyway, uh, Donald Trump, you know, I, I just said, wow, this guy is pretty powerful. And um, I said, you know, I, I, I'm thinking I'm to get involved with this presidential. I didn't, I was, no plans on getting involved in the presidential election cycle, but he was too compelling. He's a guy who was successful in business. I felt like I'd been successful in business, although I didn't have the quite the same money that Donald Trump has. I wish I had that kind of money. Uh, but he also, we knew that he cared about America. Donald Trump, you could see it in his eyes, you could hear it in his voice. He's been able to succeed in a great country like America. He believes in our country, but he put his money where his mouth is. So let me just tell you real quick, so, uh, you know, Howie Carr uh, was, was always doing Trump stuff, right? Howie was on Trump Force One, eating McDonald's with Trump, you know, I mean, all that crazy. If you guys listen to Howie, you, you know the story. So it was Howie who put me in touch with Trump's folks, Corey Lewandowski and Hope Hicks at the beginning. So, uh, you know, they were, at the time, they had a flying office. It was, it was Corey and Hope on a plane with Donald Trump, and they were flying all across the country, everywhere they could go. So uh, I got in touch with them, I said, I want to get involved. They made me the co-chair for Massachusetts, despite the fact, whatever you're hearing out there, by the way, on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so I, I ended up getting involved with the campaign uh, and ended up you know, going around uh, the whole entire state of Massachusetts on TV and on radio. Uh, was a delegate at the convention, we did an amazing job. We won the primary for Trump in Massachusetts with 50% of the vote. It was the largest margin of victory since uh, before Trump hit his home state of New York. It was the largest margin of victory. And that, that was with guys like Kasich and Rubio and Bush and all these other folks. They were still in the race. But, yeah, but, uh, but uh, Trump, Trump ended up you know, doing very well in Massachusetts. In fact, he got 20,000 Democrats to unenroll and vote for him in that primary. It was, it was amazing. And the enthusiasm, you guys probably remember this. And by the way, if you were a Cruz supporter, that's totally fine. Jim Lyons was a huge Cruz supporter. You know, I, I love Ted, Ted Cruz, but I just felt like Trump had that better chance of winning, you know, that intangible thing that was going on. And um, Ted Cruz, you guys probably remember, his campaign was pretty smart. They were trying to get those delegates uh, over to his side. Even though Trump had won the primaries, they were still, with these delegate selections, trying to get people loyal to, to Cruz to win those seats. We ended up not just winning all the Trump seats in the delegate selection for the convention, but we ended up almost running the, running the um, what is it? Sweep. Running up the scoreboard, right, with a sweep of uh, running the table, thank you, Jeez. running the table and, uh, and taking up just about every single uh, delegate for Donald Trump. So we ended up picking up seats for Trump in that uh, delegate selection process. And by the way, that's done in nine congressional districts, and there was a lot of folks here also that organized to make sure that we won those. I know, Patty, you were a big, uh, big, yeah. big helper with that, too. So. I feel like your middle name should be Trump. Good. All right, so then Trump uh, has a general election, in, and in Massachusetts, he didn't win. He didn't win Massachusetts, but he did get 1,088,000 votes. And I just want to tell you why that number is significant. He did win Saugus. In, in a presidential election cycle, there's about 3 million voters in Massachusetts. In a governor's cycle, there's about 2 million voters. So if you take all of Trump's 1,088,000 voters, into that two million election cycle, we're already halfway home. Uh, actually, further than halfway. We would already win the election against Elizabeth Warren right now if everybody who was a Trump supporter came out and voted for this election. So that's one thing. The other thing too is just think about this. 
Back when Scott Brown lost the seat, Mitt Romney was running for president. He didn't contest Massachusetts whatsoever. It was Barack Obama's re-election cycle, so he had a Democrat president, he had a Democrat governor in uh, Deval Patrick, now we have a Republican governor, by the way, the most popular in the country, evidently, and we've got a uh, Republican in, in the White House, obviously, for a president. So now things are a little different for Elizabeth Warren. It's not going to be the same. Deval Patrick's not there to step right in front of the microphone and answer questions for her when she couldn't answer them. He's probably me. Yeah. Yay. But I tell you what uh, Elizabeth Warren has in her, in her uh, corner, obviously, is a lot of money. She's raised a ton of money. And that seems to be what she's basically, you know, best at is running around the country, raising money for fellow Democrats, raising money for herself. She's got about eleven million dollars in her war chest, and uh, then she's also what's that? Yeah. And uh, in fact, you guys heard the news that Kid Rock may be running for the United yeah. States Senate. Yeah. So the, the day before she said, we find that out. She's quoted in the paper saying, I'm totally focused on Massachusetts. Then the next day, Kid Rock announces he's going to run. She puts out a fundraising letter saying, hey, we got to help uh, Stabenow, Senator Stabenow in Michigan. And she does a fundraising letter for her. I thought she just said that Massachusetts was the most important thing for her. You know, that's the biggest problem with Elizabeth Warren, going back to what I said originally. And that is that she's done nothing for the state of Massachusetts. You tell me, you get somebody to tell me what she's done to help anybody in this state. In fact, if you talk to uh, John McDonald from Veterans Assisting Veterans up in Lowell, he'll tell you that it took 113 days before she responded to a request from him for some help with a veteran up there. And it wasn't even her, it was a staffer that ended up talking to her. If you talk to people down in New Bedford, there's 60 fishing, federal fishing licenses right now that are potentially going to be redistributed out of Massachusetts. That's 243 fishermen that are hoping to keep their jobs. Has she been involved at all in trying to make sure those fishing licenses stay in New Bedford? I can tell you the answer. That's no. Right? But what she is interested in talking about is that anybody that's working for a small company or owns a small company, you're not paying women in your office enough. You know, on Pay Equity Day a few months ago, she was very much against the fact that women aren't making as much as men. And yet, we found out she pays in her own office, her Senate office, women 71% of what men make. Okay, that's Elizabeth Warren. The one who says Wall Street is so evil, she was just on Cape Cod last Friday. And guess where she went that evening? She went to... Martha's Vineyard and was hosted by a Wall Street guy to do a big fundraiser for her. Elizabeth Warren says one thing, does something totally different. You know, this campaign is going to be a lot about making sure that people know they have a reasonable alternative that's willing to go down to Washington, D.C. We've got health care crisis right now in our country, in our state. In Massachusetts, our budget, 42% of our budget goes towards health care, and it is not going down, it is going up. You wonder why there's no money, beyond the illegal immigration, why there's no money for housing for veterans, why there, our education system is having trouble making ends meet, why we keep having to have Prop 2 and a half overrides in all our towns to pay for this stuff, and Beacon Hill's running out of money, or supposedly running out of money, because priorities are out of whack, and Washington, D.C. is broken, and it's not getting fixed anytime soon. And I will say, even the Republicans down in D.C. need to get their act together. They promised us to change uh, with uh, repeal and replacing Obamacare, and they have yet to deliver. They better get on the stick and, and live up to their promises. You know, when I did the gas tax ballot question, I was warned I shouldn't do it. Don't get involved in ballot questions. You're going to ruin your career, you're going to lose, it's going to be embarrassing. I did it anyway because it was the right thing to do. And the reward was I was taken off of the Ways and Means Committee that I'd served on for four years by my own Republican minority leader, okay? That's true. There you go. Then, then, I was on Transportation Committee for the following session. I asked the governor, could you help me get on Transportation because of the work I'd done on the gas tax? Got on Transportation. I asked Stephanie Pollack, the Secretary of Transportation, how can Massachusetts handle the Olympics in just seven years without the uh, $6 billion of deferred maintenance on our roadways and our, and our T-system. I got taken off of transportation about two weeks after that, okay? But I'm not afraid of asking the right questions and pushing down in Washington, D.C. You need someone who's working, like I said, for you, not for special interests, not for entrenched politicians that have been down there forever, trying to get their members to just vote, to keep them in power and not represent you guys. 
And that's what I, I really am excited about this campaign for. We've had success in Massachusetts. We've had Scott Brown. We've had the gas tax ballot question. We pushed back on the Olympics. Charlie Baker's in. This is going to be the next moment where we show America, not just Massachusetts, we show America that we are sick and tired of the basically the face of the progressive left, Elizabeth Warren, being an obstructionist down in Washington, D.C. We didn't send her down there to stop the American agenda. We sent her down there for solutions. She's offered no solutions. All she talks about... All she talks about is how Republicans want to kill people. She literally said, people will die with this new health care bill. People will die. First of all, that's a lie. She was talking about Medicaid being cut. Medicaid actually expands under the, the Republican plans that are currently put out there. It doesn't go back. So when she's saying that people will die, it's a lie. But it's also the kind of talk that creates a situation where there's somebody who's on edge who actually, like the guy who was a Bernie Sanders supporter that ended up shooting Congressman Scalise and other congressmen randomly, these Republicans who are practicing to play baseball. The kind of talk she says about people dying pushes people over the edge to, to take action like that. She needs to stop talking like that. Stop being divisive. Stop trying to pit Americans against Americans. Stop trying to pit races against races. I have two daughters. I'm anticipating both will get married and I'll have two more, uh, two children-in-law that uh, I'm going to love. I want to leave a better future for them. I want to leave a state that they can afford to stay in, that they can come back home and raise grandkids so that I can see my grandkids someday. I don't want them to have to leave Massachusetts because our state could be like Illinois and go bankrupt and they can't afford to be here anymore. I don't want that. I don't want them to go into South Carolina because there's no other job opportunities here in Massachusetts. I want them to stay, live here, stay here. I know I'm selfish like that. I want my kids to have a better future. I want your kids to have a better future. I want you to have a great retirement someday and make sure that Social Security isn't completely gone by the time you get to those golden years, okay? That's the kind of work I plan to do every single day down in Washington, D.C. I'm not going to be flying around the country uh, raising money for Republicans. I'm not going to be writing a book while I'm in office telling you how great I am, you know, while I'm serving. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to sit down there and work like I do up on Beacon Hill, getting the job for you done every single day. So I'm hoping you guys can basically help out here. That's what I need. I know you came here and donated. I am so grateful. But at Facebook, Twitter, website, dealforsenate.com, check off a box to volunteer. Talk to the folks in the front who can sign you up to volunteer if you didn't already. I need your help. This race is going to be tough. We can only win it with that grassroots. The media is not going to cover this thing. By the way, we just announced that we had a great fundraising number for our first quarter, $343,000. It's a really good number, just so you know. It's more than Scott Brown raised in any one month up until he said people see it and then it went through the roof. But in his first, couple, first two quarters, it was more than he raised there. Did the papers, any papers pick that up? No, not in Massachusetts. Oh, well, the Herald did. Thank, thankfully, we the Herald. But nobody else picks it up because they don't want to let you know that, by the way, there is a solution. There is a replacement for Elizabeth Warren. It's time to repeal and replace her. All right? So I'm asking you to help me. I can't do this alone. You guys know that. No one candidate can do it by themselves. It's a culmination of the effort of everybody. And I am so proud to be a guy who, I'm not a millionaire. My wife and I, we have a nice house in the town of Whitman. We own a small business, but we owe more on the building that we're in than we, than we uh, have. We owe more on our house than we have. And we're not millionaires. We're just people trying to get by, put our kids through school, and do what we can. I'm so lucky to be in a position where, having worked with great people in the past, having had success in Beacon Hill and outside the chamber, I can actually be a candidate to run for the United States Senate. I pinch myself just about every day saying, is this really happening? But it's an opportunity once in a lifetime to try to do the right thing for the people in the state that I love, in the country that I love. And so thank you guys for coming out here today. Unless you come out today.